Hey everyone, this is Dr. Ruscio. Let's discuss gluten enzymes and if they are helpful, because if they are, what a win. Anything that can improve food tolerance, afford you food freedom is a huge bonus. However, it's also very commonplace that people use supplements for gut health that they don't need and maybe even make them worse. So let's recap what these enzymes are and then look at the research. Do they actually work? Because there is an answer to this question and then give you a protocol to improve your gluten tolerance irrespective of if that includes enzymes or not. Gluten enzymes, as it's probably fairly obvious, help to digest gluten, and it's mainly the amino acid proline that tends to be immunogenic or triggering for people. These enzymes are either pharmaceutical or naturally derived. There's a number of natural enzymes, some derived from papaya, some from barley, and let's look at what the evidence shows regarding the benefit, whether it be pharmaceutical or natural, we'll look at the whole uh, shebang together. Coming back to proline for a moment, let me explain how these enzymes work. Now, wheat is high in prolamines, aka proline. You've probably heard of the proteins that wheat gets broken down into, namely gladins and glutenins. And these have to be further yet still broken down into components like alpha gladin and gamma gladin, just to name a few. And these are the immunogenic proteins. Quoting from this great schematic from the journal Nutrients, alpha and gamma gladins harbor peptides with prominent immunogenicity, meaning they're very prone to trigger the immune system. And remember, this triggering response occurs in the small intestine, and we've discussed so many times how crucial and how pivotal the small intestine is as it pertains to the various sections of your GI tract. And just as sort of a preface, we should ask how common is celiac and how common is non-celiac gluten sensitivity? This means you don't have diagnosable celiac but you still notice an aversion to gluten. So NCGS or non-celiac gluten sensitivity is the other condition here to be aware of. Now, the prevalence of celiac is about 1%. Estimates vary, but you're gonna average at about 1% of the population. Prevalence of NCGS is anywhere from 0.6 up to at the most generous finding 13%. Now, why this matters is because even at the most charitable 13%, let's call the average five, that's not everyone. So that should at least give us some optimism regarding might there be a way to improve gluten tolerance? And I'm gonna develop that point in a second. By the way, if this video has been helpful, please like, comment, or subscribe. It really helps us reach and get science-based information for improving one's health out to more people. Okay. Let's break down gluten enzyme research because this is where the rubber really meets the road. And there are two different formula types that are studied, either the pharmaceutical or the natural. And they've been studied thankfully in both celiac populations and non-celiac gluten sensitive patients. So we have pretty good data to help answer the question, should we consider using a gluten digesting enzyme? And there was a really, in my mind, important randomized control trial from 2022, where non-celiac gluten sensitive individuals, probably most people watching this, took enzymes and there was a placebo group also, and then they reintroduced gluten while on the enzymes to see if their tolerance would be better. And shockingly, bloating was worse in the group using the enzymes and all other symptoms were similar, whether it was placebo or enzymes. So this led the researchers to conclude, results from this therapeutic interventional study failed to show any differences regarding gastrointestinal or psychological symptoms or quality of life. So maybe the best study thus far, showing no benefit, maybe even a negative impact.
we see a hinting of where this negative impact may come from, from this same journal article appearing in Nutrients. To quote, gluten degrading enzymes can both increase and decrease gluten peptide immunogenicity, meaning there is a potential that these enzymes may not actually reduce reactivity, they may actually make reactivity worse. And perhaps that is why the bloating was worse in the group taking the enzymes in that one trial. Now there's other data. There are three randomized control trials in celiac showing no benefit on symptoms. There is one large study, probably the largest study, again, looking at celiac, they did find a benefit. However, the placebo effect here was very large, casting doubt on the validity of these findings. That being said, this enzyme, ladiglutinase, might be worth keeping an eye on regarding if there's future research that, who knows, could show benefit. To be open-minded, I'd say right now, too early to tell. Uh, but if another trial can be published that demonstrates benefit and there's not so much of an issue with the placebo effect in this trial, then that could be something worth considering. So worth watching. And there have been a few other small studies. However, if you look at the funding and the setup, it's a little sketchy and quite a bit questionable. So in totality, I would say there's not good data showing these enzymes are helpful. You can point to a study, cherry pick perhaps, showing benefit. But if you follow the breadcrumb trail of funding, it looks like there may be some shady business behind the scenes and the more rigorous trials fail to show any benefit and may even demonstrate a deleterious effect, namely bloating, when using the enzymes. This is where a journal paper had what I felt to be a very befitting comment and to quote, however, glutenases that are currently marketed as dietary supplements have not been demonstrated to sufficiently degrade gluten in vivo and are therefore not to be recommended as supplements. Now, what about to the question of, well, I've taken enzymes, I feel like they're helping or my friend swears by them. Firstly, I believe that listening to the person is the best way to understand them and help them improve their health. That being said, we know that placebo is a legitimate thing. So we want to be careful to sort of filter observations. And I myself can say there have been a number of things I thought at first helped me. And then with further reflection and experimentation, I realized, no, it actually didn't. This matters because we don't want you wasting money on something that may not be helping you. And I wanted to share a few quick examples of this. You may have heard of this sham knee surgery study where half the people had an actual knee surgery and the other half just had an incision, but no surgery. At a two-year follow-up, they had identical results demonstrating the massive impact of the placebo effect. Not only that, but even in trials where people know they're being given a placebo, they still report benefit. So not to discount anyone's experience, but we know placebo is powerful. Okay, so then if the data here aren't great, what could we do to improve gluten tolerance? Because if you're watching this or if you're listening to this, this is what you're after, totally get it. And my goal is always to help you have the highest amount of food freedom, like I said a moment ago, possible. Well, keep in mind that if you're reactive day one, there's a good chance month three, six, nine, your food tolerance will improve if you're doing things to improve your gut health. So just simply with time and with healing, your tolerance may improve. That's point one. Now, there's this theory that in the wake of celiac or perhaps non-celiac gluten sensitivity, you can have residual dysbiosis or overgrowth. The thinking here is the inflammation, some of the damage to the gut can allow an imbalance or an overgrowth to occur. And there are data demonstrating this happens. I have also shared in the past a small study that was quite compelling that found the use of antibiotics could resolve symptoms 
in those with celiac who went gluten-free and still had symptoms. But a more recent and more rigorous trial did not find any benefit in administering antibiotics to those with celiac and SIBO who had ongoing symptoms. But there's good news here. If you're someone who believes in the power of natural medicines and diet, then I'm happy to report that the low FODMAP diet has been shown to improve symptoms in those with celiac who aren't fully responding to a gluten-free diet. And I just want to quote from one paper here. In one study, 41 celiac patients with IBS who had been on a gluten-free diet for at least one year demonstrated significant improvements in IBS symptom severity scores after three months on the low FODMAP diet. So a low FODMAP diet is one thing that can be used shorter term, a month, maybe a few months to help heal, balance, and then you should be able to reintroduce to tolerance. So that is great news. The other point I wanted to share here was regarding probiotics, because perhaps there is some type of residual or in the wake of celiac dysbiosis or overgrowth that could respond to probiotics rather than antibiotics. Because remember, probiotics will have a broad corrective action, whereas antibiotics may be more narrow in their scope. So quoting another paper, in addition to the low FODMAP diet, probiotics have shown potential benefit in individuals with celiac and IBS symptoms. A recent randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled, multi-center trial investigated the use of probiotic um, as a mixture in patients with celiac disease with persisting IBS symptoms despite a strict gluten-free diet. In total, 109 celiac patients were randomized to receive either probiotic or placebo for six weeks. The investigators noted a significantly greater reduction in symptoms with the use of probiotics compared to the placebo. So more good news in terms of if you are celiac or non-celiac gluten sensitive, enzymes don't seem to offer a lot of benefit, but a low FODMAP diet can and probiotics can. So to tie this all together to kind of a protocol or what you should consider, low FODMAP, probiotics, also consider some fasting because this can be helpful for the gut, but be careful not to fast too much. I would not recommend enzymes. And I would also encourage you to reintroduce gluten at some point. Oh, blast me. Well, hang on a second. If the problem with gluten is actually due to the FODMAPs, then you should be able to reintroduce after a successful corrective intervention like low FODMAP or like probiotics. And it's important to clarify that because you don't want to avoid gluten forever based upon faith or upon fear. And remember that the prevalence of non-celiac gluten sensitivity is not super high, roughly 5%, 13% with the most generous finding. So the odds are stacked greatly in your favor that your reactivity may be functional, maybe due to an imbalance in the gut that can be corrected with things like a low FODMAP diet and with probiotics. So sans the enzymes, trial a dietary deviation to low FODMAP, plus or minus probiotics if low FODMAP is not enough. And that should help you reduce your symptoms, continue healing your gut, and have better food tolerance over time. Okay, well, this is Dr. Ruscio. Please comment. I would be curious to hear if this resonates with you. And if you do try it, how it goes. All right, guys, talk to you next time. Mm -hmm.